And the incumbent, Assemblywoman Janet Dupree, is with us now. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Tom. It's always nice to be here. We've just heard from your two opponents, your two challengers, but really you have a third challenger, uh, opponent, if you will, uh, in this primary, um, and that's the date. Uh, being on a Thursday, one week from today, is the primary. Unusual to have it on a Thursday, and there has to be concern. Are people going to bother to get out to the polls? You know, it's a huge concern. There's always apathy, which I guess is the other opponent um, on a primary. Uh, the, the two primaries that have been held so far, the two federal ones, the presidential and the congressional, had about a 5% turnout. Um, you know, that that's atrociously low. Certainly hoping to have many more people interested in this, which is a, a more local, I think people know more about the assembly, the state legislature than, than the others. I'm, so at least I'm hoping so. And, and yes, to have it on a Thursday. Nobody votes on a Thursday. Uh, no elections are held on Thursday. And um, the legislature voted that way. I was not a fan of it. But, um, and, and I understand uh, the 9 11. It was on, on Tuesday, September 11th. it was falling on right. September 11th. So back uh, in June, the legislature voted to move yes. it to Thursday yes. the 13th. And Speaker Silver was very, it's his district where the World Trade Center was located. And he certainly was very passionate about not wanting to have um, their memorial services interfering or the, or the primary interfering with their services. So, um, you know, I part of me looked at it and said, and I could look at it from both angles. I think certainly that is a very reverent day for all of us. I could also look at it and say, what better tribute to the 3,000 plus people who lost their lives that day than to say, let's go vote. Um, certainly one of our um, most precious freedom rights um, in this country. But it is what it is. It's on Thursday the 13th, and I'm just hoping that Republicans will go out and vote. So that's been a challenge for you is to get people yes. to pay attention that yes, there is this primary and, and to get out to the polls. Absolutely. Your two opponents have painted you that they're certainly to the right of you. They, they paint themselves as being more conservative than you are and that you're too much of a moderate. What do you say to, to that? I would say that I am certainly socially more moderate than they are. Um, I take exception to some of the comments that they are fiscally more conservative than I am because there are not many assembly members who are more fiscally conservative than I am. I think certainly with my background in the county legislature and as county treasurer, I have become a very strong guardian in, of the tax dollars. And I believe that my voting record um, along that regard is, is pretty clear. So um, yes, I am a moderate social advocate, um, certainly for um, people's rights, human rights, women's rights, um, but uh, I'm a a staunch fiscal conservative. And of those social issues, the one that yeah. seems to have galvanized uh, um, a number of critics was your vote uh, in favor of same-sex marriage. Yes. And, and I've, you know, I've explained it a lot. I haven't heard a lot of criticism of it for the last year or so. There's been, since it became law, um, so there have been thousands of couples, uh, same-sex couples who have married. I've been to a couple of the weddings. Um, you know, the world has not come to an end. Uh, I think that certainly the the right of people, I talked to uh, a couple here recently who got married on their 20th anniversary of being together. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's tough to argue that two people who've been in love and have committed to each other for 20 years should not have the same legal rights that all the rest of us have. Uh, yeah, next week, primary week, my husband and I will be married 45 years. Um, I feel very fortunate that you know we have certainly a, have had a very long marriage. Both of our children have been married for in the 20 year range, one a little over, one a little under. Um, but why shouldn't everybody have the same right? And, and you know, I have, I've said it here on this show, I've said it in the past, I will continue to say, um, I, I don't see it as, as a religious issue, I see it as a civil rights issue, that every person should be treated equally that everyone should be treated the same and everyone should have the same rights. And those rights should be in, in our tax system, um, in the right for people who are in love and have committed to each other to be together at the hospital at the end to make end of life decisions. And that's what the right to marriage has done for these couples. And I, I stand by that vote and I, I was proud to be on that part of history. One of your opponents, uh, 
points to the unemployment rate, hovering around 10, 11 percent in, in, the, in the three northern mm -hmm. counties, saying that uh, the legislature as a whole and, and you as, as an assemblywoman aren't doing enough to boost the economy. What do you, what do you say to, to, to criticism that, that, that the unemployment is high up here? Unemployment is high. Um, you know, there's 3,000 jobs across the North Country that are unfilled. I don't know, and, and I've actually had meetings with Congressman Owens, and, and we've talked with Senator Gillibrand, and Senator Schumer has been here, and, you know, I think it's a federal state issue. Part of it is training. We need to train people for the jobs that are available. I fault in some ways um, our education system, and I don't mean our teachers in the schools or our professors in the colleges, but we decided at some point along the way that every high school graduate should have at least a four-year college degree. And the positions that are open, and one of the biggest demands is our welders. Uh, we need welders, we need electricians, we need plumbers, we need people who, who can handle technology and, and mechanics and you know they have to have computer skills and I, and I just I, we have a lot of college graduates who don't have jobs and that's unfortunate I mean we have a lot of teachers who now are unemployed and I so I think that we have to look at the overall picture certainly I think this state and the build rebuild New York and New York works program that the governor has instituted um, you know, the $103.2 million our North Country Regional Economic Council was able to achieve, um, that's for job creation. Uh, that money is, is specifically to be used and, and companies have to spend the money, they have to prove they've created the jobs and then they get the reimbursement. So that's a direct hands-on job creation. Um, the DOT programs, um, a huge development across all across the North Country have put our contractors back to work. I mean, they're busier than they've been in years. Um, job creation, good jobs. Um, certainly, you know, and I've, I've told the story of having been called out of session to be on the phone with the governor and, and the mayor of Kasperzak and Senator Little and all of us, the chairman of the MTA, when um, they awarded the $600 million bid to Bombardier mm -hmm. to create 300 subway cars. That's job creation here in the North Country. Created jobs at Nova Bus. Um, you know, I, I was at Trudeau Institute uh, Research Center just a few weeks ago, and we're looking at the, the one big piece they need is, is that broadband on the campus. And, and fortuitously, the day I was there, it was just coming into the campus through Dank mm -hmm. to maintain and bring in more good jobs. So the Biotech Center in Saranac Lake, uh, the Myriad R RBM uh, facility that um, has created new jobs, and certainly the Adirondack Club and Resort Project, if we can get through this latest absolutely horrendous lawsuit um, that the extreme environmentalists have against um, the ACR project, we're looking at a potential of 500 jobs. So uh, it's a tough time across the country um, with unemployment. I, I think that I wish I had the, we had the magic button, but I, I'm, I think that we're doing things right in New York. I think we're going to see them um, start to turn around. You know, we had eliminated a $13.5 billion deficit over two years, and part of that hurt because part of that was cuts that did cut jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we find the right balance, but um, I, I think a lot of it centers down into we have to, and, and we're working again, federal and state together, to determine where the job openings are, determine what skills are needed to fill them, and getting people trained so they can hold these jobs. And um, I, I, it's not easy, and, and it's particularly not easy to you know, you know look at what happened with Pfizer. Um, but a lot of of that group of people who are very well educated have worked um, in a particular field for a lot of years. Um, are now in retraining. Uh, many of them have gone through the nursing program at Clinton Community College or SUNY Plattsburgh, and, and they've said they've recognized if they want to stay in this area, they have to gain new skills. And uh, that, that's, that's a lot of, you know, a, a, a lot of us grew up in a generation where you got a job and you stayed with it f for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. you, you spent your career in one, and that's not the case anymore. And I think we've got to kind of get that mind shift going. You mentioned the deficit. Uh, yeah. The past couple of years, it seems when you ran two years ago that, that there was voter frustration yeah. and anger. Uh, there seemed to be 
uh, a collective feeling that the legislature was uh, dysfunctional in Albany. Has that changed? Uh, the, has the legislature under, under the new governor been able Absolutely. to work better together and, and pass the budget on time the past two years in a row and tackle the deficits? Is, is there a sense that, that, that the legislature is working better and getting more accomplished? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think some of, a lot of the con uh, collegiality has come back among members of the assembly. Um, I watched it certainly from my first four years where everybody was just seemed to be angry uh, to the last two years where we really all of us, most of us, worked much better together. I mean, I was as frustrated with the dysfunction in Albany as any voter was. Um, but I, again, we, you know, this governor went in with the idea that we're going to tackle the deficit. We're not going to keep uh, just pushing it down the road. And um, we did. We, I mean, we eliminated $13.5 billion in two years, is a, is a, and it's a tough job to do that. Um, you know, this past year where we took on the last $3.5 billion, you know, $11 billion the first year, the $3.5 billion this, this, this current mm -hmm. budget. Um, two billion of that was in, in cuts in spending, and and that's not an easy task to, to achieve. Um, the budget not only was passed on time; it we stayed uh, the spending is under the rate of inflation. We um, we we made some very strong statements in that budget about the direction the state of New York is going to take. Now, given my druthers, I think we went too far with some education cuts. Um, I think we've got to be very careful in the health care system with home health care and, and um, certainly with our medical centers that we don't in any way jeopardize the quality of health care that we have. But I, 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 this governor and this budget and his ability to get the legislature to step to the plate and make some very difficult cuts uh, have started to really turn this state around. And, um, you know, I, I mean, you've heard Senator Little say it. Um, you, know, you know, it's not, it, it, it has truly been between the Assembly and the Senate and the governor for the first time since I've been there, a bipartisan effort with the legislature and the governor working together um, to do some really good things for the state. A number of the governor's priorities, agenda items, have been very popular with Republicans. Absolutely. Uh, the property tax cap mm -hmm. um, that went over with uh, with a majority of Republicans. Yeah. Um, one issue that didn't get resolved this year is minimum wage. The governor has yes. been pushing for that, uh, an increase in the minimum wage. Says uh, Speaker Silver. Speaker Silver has been, has pushing, been pushing for, for the that. Most, yeah. Um, Senate Republicans have been fighting it the most. Where do you come down on, on raising the minimum wage? I was concerned about the tie to the cost of living because I'm not sure that at this point in recovery we can literally afford to put in a minimum wage that's going to be, as, as we recover, the minimum wage goes up. And I, you know, it's again, it's that when we talk about the proverbial double-edged sword, I think that certainly people are living in, in extreme poverty and should not be. Minimum wage, you know, when it was instituted, was intended to be a starting wage, not a, a living wage. And somewhere we lost a sense of that across over the years. Mm. You know, minimum wage was for the young adults or students who could get a summer job and gain some skills, or somebody coming first into the workforce who could get a job and gain some skills, and then they moved up. And the business people that I heard from the most, the small business people and the larger ones, would say to me that they aren't paying minimum wage. They're paying more than that. They're paying even more than the proposed increase. So but if they if, increase the minimum they wage, then increase the they minimum have wage, to and, and that it's thirty percent increase in minimum wage from seven and a, seven and a quarter to eight fifty. Then they have to raise their employees. And so, many of them expressed the concern they would no longer hire summer students or s summer work or instead of hiring three, they'd hire one or one and a half. Mm. That defeats the entire purpose of what we're trying to do. We're just starting businesses for the first time this year are beginning to say to me, you know what, looks like we're gonna have a good year this year. Mm. So now is not the time. So now is not the time. And, and you know, I've had people say to me, well, well, if not now, when? 
and, and I, I don't have the answer to that either, but I think that we really have to be careful that we don't undermine all of the good things that we've already done. And, and it's not just the minimum wage, it's not just the wage, you gave, it's not even the wage if somebody's making 1050 and the employer says, all right, I gotta go to 11 and a quarter now. Mm -hmm. It's workers' compensation rates go up, unemployment taxes go up, um, their, their federal um, income tax rate goes up. It's all of those costs that affect the employer that are really disconcerting right now. And, you know, I know there's some talk about us going back to Albany in November, uh, sometime between the election and the end of the year with a lame duck session. The Senate had some tax breaks they wanted to have included so that some of the small businesses would have some options in how they, um, you know, should there be an option for a 15, 16 year old student who, you know, mm -hmm. A lot of those students just, they want something to do over the summer, they do want to gain some skills, they want to have something to put on a resume, um, which is really more important in many instances than the amount of the money they make. And, and so I think there's a lot of things being studied right now. Obviously, until I see a final bill and have a chance to read it, uh, I don't often commit to anything, so uh, I, don't, I, I don't know how I will come out on that, but I, I'm very concerned about us doing more harm than good right now as we begin the recovery. Some of the major bills that passed this year include expanding the DNA database, yes. helping uh, create a state agency that's going to oversee and hopefully better protect uh, the most vulnerable people, vulnerable people in New York, uh, uh, people with disabilities uh, who, who are either cared for or, or uh, under the care of the state, yeah. or group homes, uh, either in institutions or group homes. Okay. Some people, some of the critics would say that, that those pieces of legislation are fine, but that, that there were more major bills that just didn't get the attention, the campaign finance reform, the, the tackling the redistricting and, and taking the politics out of redistricting. Um, many feel that that was kicked down, the, 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 the can was kicked down the road for another 10 years until the next census. Uh, minimum wage, some, uh, they felt some more major bills mm -hmm. just didn't get the attention uh, that, that they deserved. I think that's always going to be the case. I think again, you you know, you have that three-legged stool. <laughs> you have the the assembly, which clearly is in control of the Democrat majority, the Senate with the Republican majority, and a very strong uh, governor. And to get all of the personalities to jive and agree, what truly is the most important piece. And I think that, you know, I I, I was di incredibly disappointed with the redistricting. Um, my district came out fine. I'm, you added a few I, more towns, mostly I, in St. Lawrence County? I picked County. up four towns in St. Lawrence County. Um, I did at my request. Um, the one town I had in, in Essex County went back so that Essex County became whole. Um, Joyce Morenzi, the supervisor there, who was a member of the Board of Supervisors, had, had always felt that <laughs> she really wanted to be part of Essex County. You I had the one town of St. Armand, I right? had the one town, and, and I asked the Democrat chair of of the assembly committee to make that happen for her. Yeah. Um, it was the right thing to do, and not because I didn't want to represent St. Armand. Great people there, and I drive through it to get from one part of my district to the other, sure. so right. it, it was much easier to get to than the four towns in St. Lawrence County, but uh, sometimes you you know, you make decisions based upon the right thing for the people that are there, so. But, you know, so I'm very happy with my district, the way it came out in redistricting, but I think that there is too much politics in it. Um, I don't know how you take politics out of it because you're dealing with politicians and, and certainly some of the proposals were as bad if not worse. Um, you know, we, we found out pretty quickly, they talked about the fifth grader being able to plug it into a computer. Well, that does not work because of the federal mandates that you, know, you have to look at ethnicity and you have to look at neighborhoods and you can't divide by, by election districts. So there's a lot of, it, it, it's not just plugging in numbers. Um, there was another one that you mentioned that didn't pass. Campaign, oh, the campaign finance, campaign finance reform. reform. That's an absolute necessity. Um, I suppose it's tough to get campaign finance reform done in an election year. I don't know, but it, it should have happened. Um, you know, the, the limits should be looked at. Uh, the the way people can give to PACs and not be identified is is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, one of my concerns with campaign finance reform was that it as it was proposed, put very strict limits on on businesses and corporations and no limits on, on labor unions. 
and um, I think that's wrong. I think that the, that has to be across the board. I would I would feel the same way if it was reversed. Um, I I think there has to be. I, you know, you, I would hope in a non-election year next year, there's certainly you know between the League of Women Voters and and Unshackle Upstate and a lot of these bipartisan groups that are, are civic-minded and are working hard to try and bring reform to the state, um, that something will get done. I think uh, I think there's a lot of general support to make campaign reform happen. There's a lot of disagreement in the detail. And y you would hope that a, a lot, some of it got pounded out pretty good this year. Um, hopefully it we continue to get it done. The governor kicked off a big campaign this summer, an ad campaign that's being seen across the country in Canada, that New York's open for business, that yep. the climate has changed, that things have improved for business in New York. Have they, have they to the point where the, uh, are the taxes and, and the regulations to the point now where it is a friendlier place to do business? We're getting there. We still have a long ways to go. I still have a, a lot of concerns and hear from businesses who have issues with workers' compensation regulations and you know and, and how their employees are classified under these very broad terms that, that hurt small employers. Um, you know, I think that some of the cross-border issues are, are certainly beneficial and will get better for us, which for us here in Plattsburgh is, is great. Um, I think by getting the APA permit for the ACR, we'll set a template for future projects going forward. I mean, let's hope that there's never another project ever, ever in the Adirondacks that takes seven or eight years to be approved. The ACR, Adirondack Club and Resort yes, Project. Yes, in Tupper Lake. And I, so I think that and I think, again, this governor was very clear that he insisted that once the approval was done, it, it included the DEC approval and the Department of Health approval and the APA approval, and that, that this project is not going to have to go through all these separate entities to, to one, here's one more, here's one more, here's one more. That's where our biggest problems are. And I think we're a long way from solving that DEC has one set of regulations for a business that wants to start or change or do something. The Department of Health has another set of regulations. Uh, certainly if they're in the APA, that adds a whole different layer to yeah. it. Although it's getting better. Um, and, and that's where we have to, to look at uh, a lot of what's happening. It's, and it's quite frankly what we did a, f a few years ago with the consolidation bill. And there are still people who aren't happy with that. but. What the consolidation bill did was look at all of the towns and village laws that conflicted on how if, if municipalities wanted to consolidate or special districts or schools or, uh, no, it, it eliminated schools, but I think schools are gonna be looked at differently. But that, here's the template. Yeah, this, these are the numbers you need on a petition. These are, the, these are the time frames for publicizing. These are the public hearings you have to have. So whether people wanna, go forward or not is certainly still voluntary but the template is there and it and it eliminated all the conflicting laws and we have not done that yet for businesses a few have happened we've, we've eliminated a few of the regulations mm -hmm. that were onerous but the wage and theft prevention act horrible mandate on businesses that they have to give all these notices to their employees every year and uh, and that's from you know places like our medical centers and, and our large companies to a small business that that has to provide all of this paperwork that the employees are never going to look at <laughs> so and, and it has to be if, if you live in in some of the more urban areas it has to be in any language in which the person is fluent the employee is fluent so horrible burden thought for sure we had well we did have I believe the votes to get it passed um, but the speaker wouldn't let it on the floor so uh, you know that's got to be a priority for next year that in fact I'm hoping that that's part of the, the this extraordinary session when we go back in November so that employers don't have to do that again next year so you know I, I think that we still have a long way to go we look at agriculture and we look at some of the regulations they've had and we some have been loosened up a little, but but not enough. We still have a lot more work to be done in those. But the governor has given the direction to each of the agency heads, and he's hired some excellent, outstanding people, mm -hmm. and has said, um, you know, this is your job. 
you have to figure out how to get rid of uh, regulation so that it's easier for people to do business. One issue that the legislature's been working on for a couple of years now is mandate relief. Yeah. You were at a hearing in Lake Placid in March and you heard from a lot of towns saying this is killing us, our pension cost, our, our health care cost, other costs combined with the state mandates are, are just absolutely killing us. Are we getting any closer to giving them the mandate relief that they say they, they so desperately need? Again, baby, tiny steps. You know, for every mandate, there's a lobby group that put it there. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't just thought up. There's somebody who felt that that was a good idea and we needed to have it for whatever reason. Uh, some of them have certainly outlived their useful life some of them probably never should have been there in the first place. The governor but is promising to pay for more. They're not yes. all unfunded. Yes. Uh, to pick up the more Medicaid. of the tab, Medicaid. And, and Medicaid but, is one. They, but some, uh, still, yep. uh, the, the towns and cities yep. will tell you that, 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 that it's, it's not, not enough. enough. I, I agree, and it's not. Um, but it's, um, it's getting, uh, you know, when they set up the mandate relief team, the MRT, brought in all the stakeholders and made them members of the team. So for everybody that said, oh, that's a mandate that should go, there was a stakeholder sitting there that said, no, wait a minute, this, that's the one mandate we really need to keep. Yeah. So, okay, well, we leave that one in. Well, let's go to the next one. And then, then you've got somebody on this side who says, no, 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 that's the one we need to keep. And, and I'm not, you know, just being facetious about that, but it truly is, um, you know, I, I was criticized by one of my opponents for um, supporting and co-sponsoring the autism insurance bill. That's another mandate on health insurance that is probably going to increase health costs for the average person three to five dollars um, a month. Um, I believe that's a mandate that we needed. I believe that people with autism, children, adults, should have insurance um, as they do if they have, you know, MS or, or cerebral palsy or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I stand by that mandate, but in fact, it, 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 that's, that's what it is. Now I had uh, business people come up to me and thank me um, as well as others who said, you know, they were spending thirty-five dollars to $45,000 a year out of pocket just to get diagnosis and treatment for their children. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're more than happy to pay that extra three to five dollars a month in their health insurance costs. But so, you know, is that how you balance it? Is that how you determine a good mandate from a bad mandate? Um, it's, you know, and I sat in the county government for decades and called for mandate relief. <laughs> it, it's, it, when you, when you, and, and I still think there has to be and we have to, to help our towns and our villages, particularly now with a 2% tax cap because they just can't, in our schools, they just can't meet everything. Um, and some of the mandates that, that we have on all of them are, are really bad. Um, you know, a school that can't get rid of a teacher who's accused of, um, sexually offending a child. Mm -hmm. I mean those, and they have to pay them their full salary during two or three years of hearings. That's outrageous. Um, so I think we need to really look at, I, I, you know, one of the instances we use is a, is a teacher, an elementary school teacher who was uh, caught looking at pornography on mm -hmm. his computer in school. And it was a three year. They had to hire a substitute for three years. They had to pay him for three years. I mean, that, that, that should never be, and the, the legal fees, astronomical. Those sorts of mandates to me should be gone immediately. And they should be, there should be no discussion on that sort of thing. You, you mentioned this, uh, the 2% property tax cap. Yeah. Are, are you unhappy that that passed? You weren't, you weren't the biggest fan? Is it, uh, is it really hurting <laughs> municipalities and school districts? I was not the biggest fan. Um, I ended up voting for it um, because something like 85, 87 percent of my constituents wanted it, and, mm -hmm. and I do listen. Mm -hmm. I'm still concerned. Uh, I think we, can, we have got to do something to control property tax ca taxes. There's, I think we all agree with that, but that's where we need that mandate piece to come in. The governor promised us if we passed that tax cap that mandate relief would follow quickly, and that was two years ago. And that has not happened. And I think, again, he found out it's not as easy as, as the stroke of the pen to get rid of the mandates. But do you see progress with the mandate relief? I, I see some progress. Uh, and I think that, you know, for many of the municipalities, the 2% tax cap is, 
if they need to, they can override it. And, right. and there are some of the exemptions that the municipalities have, um, have given them some flexibility. It's much more difficult for the schools. Um, I think that we have schools across this district and across this state that in two years are going to have no fund balance left. They've dipped into their reserves for They've a couple of years now. They've into them now and they may have a year left, they may not have a year left. And then we are, you know, we're going to see serious cuts in programs and again more cuts in staff if we don't find the right mandate relief or change the way the tax cap is assessed and, and maybe it's a question of you know, taking out exemptions for, for some of the other necessary expenses that the schools have, but they've got to be addressed. I, I, I think that, and I know there are people who feel there's a lot of waste in the school systems, and in some instances there may be, but New York has prided ourselves forever on a high quality education of educating our students from, you know, birth to through higher ed. and. I, I don't want to be a part of an institution that has that stop. And the governor has beat the drum over waste and yep. consolidation, the need to consolidate, but that's really directed downstate yep. to much larger districts. There really is, is, uh, is there little room for consolidation in, in such a rural area like Northern New York? Well, look at, you know, Saranac Lake is the largest geographic school district in the state of New York. Where do you consolidate? How much further do you do you put your children? I, I watch the school bus go by my house at a um, little bit after six o'clock in the morning. Um, it's a high school run, which you know, you know that's that's one thing. But you know, and I guess it's the grandmother in me. I look at our kindergarten and first grade, and I say they're still babies. Uh, how many hours? a day do we put bus. them on a bus and do we put them on a bus at, at, in the middle of the night or in darkness not in the middle of the night but in darkness and, and when, when do we where, where's the right balance do you see the day though where the city of Plattsburgh Peru Beekman town could all be run by one superintendent's office something like that uh, yeah I don't want to talk specific districts but I think we certainly can consolidate some of the what we call the back room I think certainly a superintendent can can be a superintendent for more than one school. You know, we've been watching very carefully the Brush to Moira, St. Regis, um, or Salmon River, mm -hmm. Brush to Moira, Salmon right. River. Um, it, it's, it's worked pretty well. Um, I, I think that there's certainly room for that. I think there's, there's room for um, more, I mean, consolidating a payroll system. For what? Oh, maybe for all nine school districts mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in Clinton County or in the seven in Franklin County. Um, you know, again, then that, that creates a job loss or has the potential of creating job loss. Right. But I think in today's world with, with computerization and with the ability to transmit everything electronically, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to do those sorts of purchasing. Um, there's so many ways that, and, and, and to their credit, I think our school superintendents are sitting down and talking very seriously with each other about the best way to do it. I'm not sure they're talking seriously about eliminating their own jobs. Mm -hmm. right. But I think is, um, you know, we, we look at, at people leaving and, and, and have openings. Is that something we should do? I, I, a part of, again, I mean, there's some mandates that the state should really seriously, you know, before you, you couldn't, they had, the, the Elizabethtown just had to get authorization to have their superintendent also be the principal. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's against the it, there's a mandate that says you can't do that. Um, so we talk about mandate relief, but we have these blockages that are in the way, and I I, I think that s schools can't really share staff. Uh, y you know, we have um, you know could could two or three school districts share three or four language teachers or science teachers or math? I but those are the things they ought to be able to look at, but then it affects their state reimbursement and it affects their foundation aid and it affects so many. So we have a lot of work to do at the state level to help our schools before we point too many fingers. You mentioned earlier, you, you talked about the, the regional economic development councils, the 10 yes. across New York that competed for the first round of funding. The North Country got more than a hundred million dollars. Um, something we heard mentioned time and time again at those hearings and it wasn't included among the top priority projects because uh, it's not quite to that shovel ready stage yet but we kept hearing the rooftop highway coming up again and again and again at those hearings you had a number of proponents and opponents speaking out as we look at future rounds of this funding is this still something that 
is a top priority for this this region uh, and at what how do you see that project at this point do you support it do you support uh, uh, the full interstate do you support fixing up route 11 and making it more efficient or is it uh, is it uh, just too expensive of a, of a project and the, and the payoff isn't worth it? Of course, Route 11 is getting a lot of construct reconstruction uh, in this round of uh, state financing. The, Rutal, the rooftop highway is something, I, you know, I, I've been around long, I go back to Congressman Robert McEwen, who said that that was the last thing You're he wanted to accomplish. Now, yeah. He said he wanted to accomplish yeah. that in his, in his career, and I, I, I don't even remember when, when Bob died, so it's been a long time. This has been on the table um, it's, decades. It's been out there for decades. The cost continues to increase exponentially, uh, not only for the cost of construction, but um, particularly if you talk a four lane, uh, the cost of purchasing the property, of getting rights of way, of, of doing all of that. And I, you know, I have supported it. I've backed off from my support. I've gotten lukewarm. I've gotten I've kind of, because it's been around so long that I guess I've, I've sort of shifted over the years. Um, Do you I buy into the argument that it's needed though to, I, I can for, for economics, for, for, economic for commercial, absolutely. I can see where it would be a huge help. Um, I, it, the state cannot do it alone. There, it, that's not even any possibility. Uh, I think there certainly has to be a combination of federal and state and perhaps private. This is something being Funding. talked about. The yep. uh, state of Maine is looking at that yep. right now, an east-west yep. highway primarily funded by private yep. money. Is that, are we to the point where that's something that I, we should seriously look at? I think we have to. I, I think there has to be a combination of um, that sort of, uh, for a project of that monumental, so I mean, look at the cost of the Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, talking about something that's highly million. traveled that has to be, yep. has to be fixed. And, and so I, I think these, and these projects are so expensive and I, certainly for economic development, um, you know, you look at the Rouses Point to Watertown corridor, mm -hmm. just getting goods back and forth. For, so I travel Route 11 a lot <laughs> and just being able to get on a, a four lane and, and even to, to get the trucks off onto a four lane. I'll tell you one of my fears, and again, I was around pre-Northway uh, mm -hmm. when my dad's family all lived in New York City and we used to travel down Route 9 and it took a long time to get there and it was it was a cumbersome ride but we went through every little village along the way every town and village and and when you look at some of these communities um, Scroon Lake and and some of the others that that when the Northway came through I mean I would hate to think of going to Albany as often as I do without the Northway so I'm not so you I have think the same the concerns about 11 for some I of the small, the same that there may be a trade-off. I they think there's a trade-off, and I think we have to be very conscious of that. And and I'm not, and it would depend a lot on where access uh, back and forth is. And, you know, some of those communities, Malone, they're, they're working very hard to rebuild um, their downtowns. And um, if you don't have traffic. And when you talk about the private capital, what would the payoff be for them? Would you have to make it a toll road? You might, and, and is that feasible in a district as rural as ours? I mean, there's a huge study that is here. You know, Senator Gillibrand had a, what was it, a hundred and some odd million dollar study. Right. So when you start looking at that much money just to study it, but yet I think you have to, you know, like peeling the onion, you have to get down to the core of where do you, where exactly where do you lay it out? How many homes, how many families? Right. Do you put out of their homes? How many farms do you cut in half? Yep. Um, how much is the cost of that? Then where are you connecting? And what's the proposed traffic going to be? Um, so that is it worth a toll road? Will people pay a toll? Will they use it? Will they not? And, and so, I mean, when we look at the throughway now, proposing a 45% increase in tolls for uh, commercial care traffic. is commercial yep. traffic. I mean, that's outrageous. So, and how many years has that been in? You know, so when we looked at the bridge between Plattsburgh and Burlington, um, the toll was going to be astronomical to pay for it. If, and, and the days of building, because they'll come and you don't have to charge, uh, they're, they're just not here right now. And I, I, don't, I don't expect I'll see that kind of um, generosity coming out of government in my lifetime. You mentioned the throughway. Obviously the throughway doesn't go through 
your district, but people from up here certainly right. hook up to the thruway to get to New York City and out west. It seems we're hearing more and more of the political leaders now lining up against that total oh, increase yeah. that you're talking about. Tom yeah. DiNapoli came out against it, uh, the governor seems to have come out against it, and the other leaders. So do you think uh, that, that there's enough political opposition now that the Thruway Authority isn't going to get that, that total increase? I, I certainly hope so. Um, you know, the, the, the disadvantage of a separate authority is that they can institute the increase if they want to, and there's, I mean, uh, you would hope they would listen to all of us they're who have expressed. They're feeling political heat right now. They've got to be feeling a tremendous amount of political heat, and they're certainly getting pummeled at their public hearings that they're having. Um, and again, it doesn't come cut through our district, but there, there aren't many products that get um, to the North Country that don't somewhere pick up the throughway. Come along the throughway. Uh, you think and, and our farmers, our, our agriculture, our, our apple growers who, when they ship out, it goes on the throughway, and, and those are the places that are going to get her. But anybody, oh, they're coming up to the big box stores, to the Lowe's and the Walmarts. Um, they're using the throughway, and, and who pays the final bill is, is you and me. You think 45% and singling out truckers is yeah, excessive? I do. I absolutely do. If you win re-election, yes. what is your top priority for the next session? Well, certainly continue with the economy, creation of jobs, I and mean, it's got to be. There's nothing more important than creating jobs in the North Country. You know what an advocate I am for the North Country. I, I, I guess the beauty of, of what... Uh, Teresa Sayward and, and Betty Little and I have been able to accomplish is that I don't care if it's a colleague from the Bronx or from Manhattan or from uh, Cattaraugus County, they now talk to me about the North Country. <laughs> We're no longer considered part of upstate and that's that's something we have accomplished and, and, and we've got to continue to grow our economy and, and, and I, I feel confident about it. I, I think again, we have good federal people, we have good local people. Um, certainly our chamber and our economic development councils and, and our development corporation, our idea. I think we can all work together to get these jobs done. Um, I, I am, on a personal level, um, very interested in continuing to work with the state education department to make some changes, what I would hope would be significant changes in the way they do business. Um, I have said probably not very politely uh, to the commissioner and to members of the Board of Regents that I think the State Ed Department is the most dysfunctional department we have in the state of New York. Uh, people who have to, all professionals, who have to be licensed through him, through them, um, wait weeks and sometimes months to even get an answer on whether or not they can get their license. I mean, it's from nurses to physical therapists to it doesn't matter what they are. Mm -hmm. I am horrified at their decision, the Board of Regents decision and the State Education Department decision to stop giving local high school diplomas. Um, I think that their children, whether they happen to be children, um, such as certainly you know my advocacy for special needs children, mm -hmm. um, whether it's somebody with Asperger's who is incredibly bright but can't test, mm -hmm. um, whether it's some, some people just can't test well. Uh, the fact that a child, a student cannot pass a Regents exam means that that child does not get a high school diploma is is outrageous. Um, I mean, that system's worked pretty well. You, you go anywhere outside of the state of New York, they don't, they don't care about a Regents diploma. Um, and, and there's enough standardized testing throughout the system that we know if students are or are not accomplishing what they need. Um, so I think that, and, and I hear from parents and, and across the state on this issue because I have been incredibly vocal. Uh, so I, certainly that will continue to be a focus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I think it's, it's regulations from the, from the state education department. I'm not criticizing our education system in our schools. It's, it's at that level. Uh, continuing to work with our medical centers, um, certainly the affiliation that's happening um, between CPPH and and Fletcher Allen, I think, mm -hmm. is, is progressive. And, um, you know, we, we deserve the same quality of care in the North Country. Every single person has a right to good quality health care provided by very qualified physicians. And um, recruiting is an issue. We're certainly hoping that the affiliation um, helps us with that. Um, Hudson Headwaters coming into the Champlain area. Um, you know, working with all of these, I mean, there, there's nothing more important than people having good health from, again, from birth to death. And, and so that's, and, and, and again, we have to look at the regulations. And, and we've talked with the Commissioner of Health and um, saying, you know, it's, 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 it has, hasn't been done before mm -hmm. um, that we cross state lines and say, you know, we're, we're really going to be 
sporting more as one. I deal with an inordinate amount of health insurance issues in my office from people who are denied health, right. uh, denied referrals, denied the right kind of care. Um, so I, th I think these are the these are the quality of care issues. They, you know, and again, I've said it before. You've heard me say it. Probably everybody else has heard me say it. Uh, Albany is Albany. Uh, it's important what we do down there, passing the budget, working on mandate relief, doing things. But the part of the job I love is what I do here in the district, uh, getting out and meeting with people and talking with people and being able to help somebody who has a problem with a retirement issue or a workers' compensation or a disability or or just an education problem, or just somebody who's got a child with a special needs that just needs to talk. Um, that's what this job is about. And um, that's, so those are my focuses. But um, I guess those are the kind of the top three. Obviously, every day is very busy, and, and every day seems to bring a surprise. <laughs> Janet Dupree, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Tom.